Welcome back. You're listening to Get Real. I'm your host, Bob Callagher. I'm joined in studio today by our co-hosts, Mike McCormick and Aaron Thomason with Ross Mortgage. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. We also have Justin Jarbo with us today from Keller Williams and Worcester. Welcome back, Justin. Thanks. So we invited you in to talk about uh, investing in real estate. Hot topic. Yeah. It seems like everybody wants to flip houses. According to HGTV, all you need to do is be able to find a place and you make 100000 pretty much automatically, right? That's exactly how it works. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke for the record. Yeah. Yeah. So can you walk us through the process? Because there's a lot of people out there, myself included. Like every time you watch one of these shows, and you're like, wow, it, that's so, it's so easy. <laughs> Buy a house, fix it up a little, get a huge profit. I mean, where's the downside? Yeah. I'm guessing there is a downside. Maybe we should talk about that a little bit to get started. Um, I think it's way over complicated than it really needs to be. Mm-hmm. Um, so there, when we talk about investing, there's really two dynamics to it. There's the flipping portion mm-hmm. and then the buying and holding portion. And right. They do two totally different things, right? Right. So um, with the flipping part, I think it's just a mathematical equation. So right. you just need to look at the numbers, make sure they make sense, and then reverse engineer it so that you can find a property and flip it. Right. It, at its at its basic sense. Right. And people that you're working with that, that are flipping houses, are they experienced like contractors or do you have people literally that just decided, hey, I own a house. How hard can this be? I'm going to do it too. <laughs> that's the uh, that's television for you. So yeah. no, we, we do work with first-time uh, investors. We do work with seasoned investors. Uh, and everyone in between. So we treat yeah. them all equally. Uh, right. The newer guys obviously need some more guidance. Yeah. Um, there's some really good books out there that we highly recommend that kind of puts a game plan together. Right. But as long as you've got a good team around you and you're you're focused on the right things, then then it makes sense and it's profitable. Right. So, I mean, let's talk a little bit about the right things. Like here's a, I guess this is a starting point. How do you identify a house that's worthy or makes sense to flip? So uh, the first thing that we do with with first time investors is get all the basics out of the way. You know, like how much can you afford? How liquid are you? What's your plan B if this doesn't work out? So once we get through like all of that stuff, then what we recommend is identifying a specific area that you want to invest in, mm-hmm. and not going outside of that that zone. Right? right. So stay super laser focused and find a deal there. Um, and when we say find a deal, it's just a deal that makes sense for you. So okay. at the basic sense. What you could do is you find uh, a property that you think might be a candidate for this and then just reverse engineer it. And what I mean is figure out what's the after repair value. Mm-hmm. So after we clean up this house and do what's normal for that neighborhood, because we don't want to over improve the house either. Right. If the neighborhood is all you know, granite countertops and things like that, you don't want to go too low. You don't want to do for mica, but you also don't want to do some custom yeah. uh, countertop. Grade five countertops that cost exactly. you twice, yeah. twice as much, right? So once we figure out that and figure out, okay, so after repair value, which is ARV is X, then you take, you know, how much money is it going to take to, to get that property to that level? Mm-hmm. So that might be 50 grand, 60 grand, 70 grand, whatever it is. You take the ARV minus that, and then minus a, a profit margin that's fair for you at, at a minimum. So a minimum profit margin. So, and what do people usually go into thinking is fair? I mean, because there's a lot of risk if you're going to do this. So that's the interesting thing. Everyone's different. Yeah. Me personally, uh, it's got to be a minimum of 20% return on my cash. Right. Um, or a fixed number of like 35000 right. right. So you're not going to roll the dice to make ten grand. Not at all. No. Because nope. it'd be way too easy to lose twenty. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. it's risk and reward. So yeah. other people's risk tolerance might be a little bit higher than mine. Some right. might be a little bit lower. Um, so it's just case by case basis, right? So you take that minimum profit margin, whatever it is that they feel comfortable with. Some of them do it for free on the first couple, just so they can gain the experience and everything else. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't recommend it, but that's an expensive education. It is. yeah. Yeah. So, and then you just take that, subtract that, subtract that. And then what are your carrying costs? So how long is it going to take to renovate this property? Mm -hmm. You know, six months, five months, whatever, and then figure out, okay, how much money am I going to be spending on my taxes, my insurance, lawn maintenance, things like that. Right. And then you've figured out and reverse engineer what your maximum offer price is, right. which includes a profit. And then you just, you negotiate from there. So if you can get it for less, great. You just added more profit. Um, but you know, your max is that to make the money that you need to make. Right. And what kind of properties do you, do you see people doing? Is it mostly multis, mostly singles? Can you even do it on condos? Does it make sense or... <laughs> Um, yeah, so we see it on all of them less, mm-hmm. less on multifamilies, but I think that's actually going to be, 
uh, coming up more so now that there's a lot more attention to this area on multifamily investing, right. especially from like New York, Boston, things like that. The cap rates out there are really low. So yeah. people are looking at Worcester as a hot topic. And if an investor is not local and they're not um, here for day-to-day operations, then they want turnkey. Yeah. So I think there's an opportunity to do that, to flip multifamilies. Mm. Um, but most of the time it's single families. And then uh, sometimes we see condos. I've had really, really good luck with the condo space. Okay. And I guess it's another version of type, but when you're looking for houses to flip, are you looking for something that maybe was owned by an elderly couple that hadn't been updated since the seventies? Or are you looking at like the haunted 1800s house on the corner that nobody's lived in in 40 years? <laughs> I mean, or is it everything from that? And in, in yeah, between? It, so it's, it's, uh, it's everything. Yeah. So it's whatever makes sense financially. Okay. So and- we look at, you know, if it's fire damaged, if it's water damaged, if it's, you know, just mismanaged all mm-hmm. of it. Okay. So it really depends on the property. It does. But yeah. in a typical flip, what are, what are people looking at doing? I mean, basically kind of refreshing it, kitchen, bath, carpet, paint. Yep. That yeah. Type so of stuff. Well, um, it's kind of a loaded question. Mm-hmm. So it depends on who the audience is. Yeah. So if you're in Worcester, for instance, and you're selling the after repair values, like say 300 or something around there, like 250, 300, mm-hmm. then you're going after a first time home buyer. So right. you're going to spend the the money on the kitchen, the bathrooms and cleaning it up and making it look really presentable. You're mm-hmm. not going to go over the top with like some of the big um, ticket items that are going to cost a little bit more. Yeah. Like you're, you're not, not putting in a sub zero fridge. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's another good point too. Additions probably don't make a lot of sense if you're doing a flip. Not in the, the low end. Uh, as yeah. you go towards Boston where mm-hmm. um, larger homes are, are desired then you maximize the the space on the lot. Mm-hmm. That's a lot more common. So yeah. let's say you got like a 5,000 square foot lot. Um, that seems to be pretty normal as you get closer to Boston. Uh, what you want to do is maximize the square footage of the house on that footprint. Yeah. So a lot of times there are... Um, so like five feet of grass around the house is basically what you get. <laughs> yeah, yep, yeah. exactly. But that's acceptable out there. Well, that's what's desired, yeah. you know? So the, the landscaping isn't as big of a, a thing. They just want to be close access to Boston right. and the school systems. Right. And what, when you're trying to figure out what the budget's going to be to rehab a house, uh, do you find people going out by themselves and just kind of eyeballing it? Or are they bringing <laughs> contractors with them? Or <laughs> we see Again, both. you see both. Yeah, I see <laughs> both. Yep. Yeah. The right way to do it is to uh, either have the market knowledge mm-hmm. yourself or bring a professional, like a licensed contractor. Right. Just so you can get some sort of baseline. And then the more that you do it, you know, it's just like a muscle, right? If you yeah. go to the gym and try to deadlift 600 pounds today, if you're not toned and like conditioned to do that, you're going to get hurt. Right. Same thing goes in investing real estates. You're building a muscle. So the more you do it, the more that muscle gets toned. Right. So if you go in just trying to like guess on this and guess on that, then you're going to get hurt financially. Right. And how do you, I mean, there must be some sort of a fudge factor when you're coming up with a budget for the house. Cause you never know what you're going to get when you open up a wall. Right. That's a really good point. So I always recommend putting a 15% contingency on whatever the number is that you're estimating for right. rehab. Right. And I'm guessing it's probably a good idea to have a contractor you're working with on a regular basis. Correct. Because that, that's one of the things we've heard from people that want to add on to their houses instead of moving is good luck getting a contractor to come out. And when you do, get ready for sticker shock when you get the estimate. Yeah, it's been it's been more challenging lately for sure. Yeah, there's such a shortage. I'm just wondering if that's starting to affect you know people's willingness to invest based on how difficult it is to actually find people to do the work. Or are you seeing that it's not as difficult in certain areas. Um, no, it's so it depends on the area, right? So mm-hmm. this area definitely is, uh, is more challenging to do the flips. Uh, but you know, it's again, case by case basis. If you have a good relationship with a contractor and you can get them to commit to a certain time frame, mm-hmm. then you're good. But if you're a new guy starting out and you have no guidance, you don't have a good team, yeah. with a realtor, mortgage broker, like it, when I say team, it's like all of those things, attorney, it all comes together as like right. one big piece uh, or pieces of a puzzle. Mm-hmm. And when it all lines up, then it works. But if you're trying to cut corners and you know, you're, you're shopping rates on this and that, um, then it can, it can become issues. Right. So like g- give an example. So in your world with lending, mm-hmm. if you're a buyer and you're trying to buy a bank owned property, um, you have a certain time frame to perform even mm-hmm. with like auctions, right? So right. if you want to buy an auction, there's a certain time frame. You have 30 days to perform. Right. So if you're going around shopping rates and this and that and trying to go online and do that, yeah, you might get a lower rate, but you're going to get terrible service compared to the local folks like yourself. Mm-hmm. And it's going to jeopardize the transaction because if they, you get into the 11th hour and they need an extension because they weren't doing their job, mm-hmm. then you just lost the house. 
Yeah, because they don't extend. You basically just lose your deposit, right? Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. they don't have to. Sometimes they do, but mm. I've seen people lose houses that way. Right. Well, on auctions, I think you lose it, right? Right. Yeah. Yep. yep. Yeah, so that's tough. You certainly well, want to avoid that. Sometimes the banks, too, though. Uh, yeah. I haven't seen it as much lately, but I think as we get more foreclosures and there's more shadow inventory, I think that that will certainly return. So. Mm-hmm. Good. What other what pitfalls do you see people kind of hit commonly their first time around? <laughs> We're just talking be a about big this. List. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the biggest one is they are renovating the house uh, as if they were going to live there. So mm. their standards, right? Yeah. Um, they're not looking at market knowledge, uh, and they're they're like, okay, what kind of flooring do I like? What kind of cabinets do I want? Mm-hmm. And they're adding their own flair, and I think that's what the sexiness of mm-hmm. flipping is. It's like you're renovating, restoring something and like making it new. Mm -hmm. And it's really exciting. You put all your heart and soul into it and sweat and everything else. Mm -hmm. So like you're really proud of it. But at the end of the day, you need to mirror what you're doing for renovations to what the consumer actually wants. Right. And so that's the biggest misconception. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, I mean, we've seen people put in like crazy expensive marble tile in certain areas. Mm -hmm. We've seen people put the wrong tile in certain areas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. We had a, a guy had a, so <laughs> there was a, a, a fireplace, right? And so instead of doing like a stone facade or something like that to mm-hmm. go like a, the cheaper route, he, he like put tile up, but he wrote, put the wrong tile. It was actually bath tile all around. <laughs> um, and so it was like, just stood out like a sore thumb. And yeah. you know, if, if you didn't know that and you were in the industry and you were like a first time home buyer with, no parents to talk you off the cliff. Yeah, then you might you might get away with it, but right. um, it didn't it didn't look good. And I think a lot of other people would have agreed with that. Yeah. So things like that. Those those are the big ones. So don't design the house for yourself. You want to design Correct. it for the people you're trying to sell it to. Yeah. So if you're a first time home buyer, go after the first time home buyer stuff. Right. You know, and look at the demographics too. So a lot of first time home buyers um, are between the ages of 25 and 35, somewhere, I mean, we can get into the microeconomics of it, but Mm -hmm. let's just generally say that 10 year span. And so they care about technology, right? Yeah. So some of the big things that we're suggesting to our investors right now, they're flipping to that category of people is add the the USB ports on the kitchen counters for the the smartphones. Take in the bathrooms, there's like halo lights uh, that have built in Bluetooth speakers. So you can hook up Pandora when you're taking a shower. Mm -hmm. And those things don't even cost that much money. Yeah, like a hundred bucks, right? Yeah, it's yeah. like a hundred, hundred twenty bucks, and the outlets I think are like forty dollars. But it's all that little we call sizzle factor stuff that mm-hmm. really draws in the attention. So if you have two identical homes and you have someone that's say thirty, thirty five looking at this house and they care about those things because they're in the smart world, um, then they're going to look at that versus the other house if they're the same price and they're going to pick the one that has all the extra smart stuff. Right. Especially so it, like even the thermostats and like ring doorbells and, you know, yeah. you could do all sorts of crazy stuff now. Yeah. And it seems like everybody switched over to Nest or whatever the Google version is. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yep. At minimum, do like yeah. a programmable that has Wi-Fi access that's like a cheaper grade. Yeah. Not the $12 one that you need a degree in programming to get the dates changed on it. <laughs> no, no. Some or the, we terrible. still see analog too. Really? Yeah. Yeah. We still see some of the Even analog. though they still made those. I, maybe they took it from the other flip and <laughs> <laughs> recycling. <laughs> recycling. Yeah, that's yeah, great. Yeah. And if you're looking to rehab a house, uh, what kind of determines whether or not people are looking to flip it or do the work and actually hold on to it for rental income? Uh, difficult question to answer. Mm. Uh, I would say going in, you really got to have your plan A. Gotcha. So whether you're looking at it through the flip lens or the, the hold lens, yeah. um, and really focusing on that and then potentially, you know, switching it if things aren't going right to try yeah. to just get out and recover your, your equity. Right. And in the Worcester market, are you seeing any of what's happening in, in the, you know, the Boston market right now with people buying multis and turning them into condos or is that not really worked its way that far west um so that did work its way far west uh Mm. many years ago and uh, so that was really popular i would say you know 10 15 years ago right um we're not seeing it as much now because the multifamily market is so hot and Mm -hmm. they are selling for like retail like really retail numbers Mm -hmm. um so like a three family for example if it's cleaned up and in the the condo condition, if you were gonna you know sell those condos, it has to be like really good condition. Right. Those are all selling for like four hundred k. All right. So, so you, you would have to sell an individual condo for you know one hundred and fifty per floor, uh, and that was that's only a fifty thousand dollar profit. Yeah. To do that, 
So is it worth the hassle? Probably not. Not really. Not now. So yeah. it's, again, everything's case by case basis. You got to look at what you have, what's available, what the demand is, and then maximize the, the money right there. Okay. And what would you say is the biggest success you've seen for, for people you've worked with? Uh, in what capacity? So people that how often they do it and whether or not they make a good amount of money when they do them. Yeah. So the, the repeat people yeah. that, uh, that take their lessons and just roll it forward. Those are the ones that, that we're seeing making the best profits because gotcha. they're refining their systems. They're getting the contractors to, to really work with them. They're knowing what to ask for, what to avoid things right. like that, you know? And you see in big numbers, like, is it like the 20 to 40 range? Usually, if you're, you're talking about the Western market, do you see people walking away with six figures on some flips? Uh, less of the six figure, more mm. between, I would say, 30 and 60 would be like a slam dunk. Oh, wow. Um, we've had some personally that, that were really, really good, um, mostly on the condos, believe it or not. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So I would think there wouldn't be as much room on a condo flip. Um, yes. Well, it depends you, on you, the condo. Yeah. So normally, yes. Yeah. Uh, the reason we've had a lot of success with the condos was with the auctions. Oh, so okay. if you, the single family market, for some reason, uh, like wall street, or there's a lot of institutional money buying a lot of these properties as like big packages. Right. So, uh, I don't know the, the exact, so I'm just kind of speaking off cuff right now. So mm -hmm. don't hold me to this, but I think it's something along the lines of the banks are, are seeing that their the market has increased. So they're doing light renovations. Mm -hmm. They're buying them back from the auctions and retailing them or packaging them and selling them to like institutional money or like wall street and things like that. Oh, wow. So there's less, less opportunity to buy at auctions right now. Anyway, right. for single families, the condos, they haven't really had that same perspective on it. Mm -hmm. So we've had opportunities where we bought multiple condos and, and we're able to flip them for a strong profit. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. All great information. I want to give out your uh, contact info. Again, it's Justin Jarbo with Keller Williams Realty in Worcester. The number to get a hold of uh, Justin if you're looking to buy or sell real estate or if you're looking to invest in real estate, 508-322-1499. Again, it's 508-322-1499. Thanks for joining us again, Justin. That was great info. Yeah, thank you. We're going to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with more Get Real after this.